This is Contestants Not Appearing on Stage, a weekly game show podcast for game show enthusiasts. Episode number eight, Selling the Drama, recorded December 13th, 2015. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Contestants Not Appearing on Stage. My name is Torgo. Thanks for joining me. And also joining me this week are my co-hosts. Let's see who's here. I'm Jordan, a.k.a. Unique Perspective. And baby, it's cold outside. I'm Jason, a.k.a. JJ, a.k.a. The Price is J. And I am not a spiteful old 92-year-old man who fired everybody. Thank you. (laughs) So much for Christmas. I'm Randy, <laughs> a.k.a. Jack Lunchboard 91. <laughs> and all I want for Christmas is for Mariah to be back on top. Aww. I didn't realize Nick, Nick Cannon was joining us today. <laughs> and I'm Nick, and clearly I'm having a silent night. It is Nick Cannon here today. Our first topic for today, usually we start off with The Price is Right. This past week we had Pet Adoption Week. But you wouldn't really know it unless you saw one certain segment <laughs> of each part of the show. Right before the third item up for bids, Monday they had Amber talk for a little bit about the pets that she adopted the last time they ran Pet Adoption Week. Then they had George talk over Rachel holding a pet. Then they had two special guests on Wednesday and Friday. And then they had James hold a dog while George was talking over them. And besides an audience giveaway, there weren't themed showcases. There weren't any guest showcases. And like I said, outside of that one segment, they didn't really address the topic at all. So I guess we'll start off with, do you feel like they should even bother with the pet adoption week if they're going to kind of phone it in like they did? I talked about this before last week. My main problem is the idea of the pet adoption week. Do it in this compressed time frame for a single segment. I think in general, the way the pet adoption worked best was a spattering throughout the various shows. Just the little segments here and there. Here's a pet. And information about a shelter or how you can adopt pets. Which, by the way, I'm pretty sure this special never even touched with a 10-foot pole. Hey, what if I wanted out the pet on my own? I feel like they didn't really address that. To be fair to the show, when they were in Barker years, they never talked about that. They tell you that the pet that they have right there is available at the Los Angeles SPCA. But they then say, if you're interested in adopting someone like the pet we have, contact your local animal shelter. Yeah, a shelter near you, and that was fine. I didn't like that they had so much for like the SPCA Los Angeles. Like, Were they paying for promotions? Also, Who something knows? I want to point out, if you go online and check out when the Pet Adoption Week was, because it's a national thing, and it was November 13th. So well, we're only late by way. four weeks. <laughs> let's put it this way. The show isn't exactly press celebrating anniversaries on time. They celebrated Plinko's 30th anniversary about nine months later. <laughs> so... I'm not too pressed. I'm not going to blame them too much there anyway. I just don't know if the idea of a themed week works rather than just the occasional segment, as I had just said before. Would it work better as a day? Yes, but I don't know if like it will also work to say one to make one day of the whole season pet adoption day. Like if like if they truly believe in like the pet adoption cause, I wonder if the best way to handle it would be like a day every two weeks or once a month or something rather than just the condensed week. The main vibe I got from the show isn't, I mean, Amber probably had the most sincere aspect of it because she adopted her pets when they did this two years ago. But other than that, I feel like, especially with just parading out the celebrities to speak maybe 15 words each, other than, I just felt like they were going through the motions. It felt like they were obligated to do it. Like, oh, well, the SBCA just gave us a nice little bonus. We We need to do this, so... Pet Adoption Week segment time. Woo! I mean, this is one of the rare, you know, themed weeks where they, A, don't have a special logo, and B, don't mention it off of the top of the show. It really just felt like a week of regular shows that just happened to have a pet adoption segment in them. And if that's the case, I agree with Jordan. It's like, you might as well just start spreading them out across the season, maybe once a month or something like that. Like they used to do with Barker. I agree. It was super awkward because I think cover up was like second or first or something. And there was the dog and Drew was like, 
oh yeah, it's a dog because it's pet adoption week, but they hadn't mentioned it yet. So it was just kind of like almost an aside. So if that was the first show you'd seen for the week, you're like, what is he even talking about? Mm-hmm. Yep. I remember that. The only other thing about pet adoption week is that all of the pets were dogs, which is all fine and good. I love dogs, but if you want an accurate representation of, of what uh, of a situation that here could comes be Jordan with the all pet lives matter banter. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I like if the idea is to in general promote pet adoption, why not just get one kitten in there? You know what I mean? Get a cat. The show had a rabbit on before, you know, mix or it up a little bit. Yeah, I the only agree. reason the I can think that no... is like, maybe there's some sort of regulation in studio 33 of what animals can and can't be in there. Cause when, like, like, you know what? Dang it. Mike Richards hates contestants. Now he hates cats, too. Darn you, Mike Richards. But they've had cats before, so I don't understand why they couldn't have had a cat. Well, I mean, if they had cats on the bark air, who knows what's changed since then. Yeah, but they couldn't have a regulation unless the regulations have changed. That's what I'm... It's I mean, possible. the seating regulations have changed, so... Maybe one of the staff is allergic to cats. I don't know. Maybe Drew's well, allergic. Why would that? That would be something. So that's Pet Adoption Week. Did you like it? Leave a comment and let us know. Sticking with the prices right for a little bit, there was some. Um, I don't know if I want to use the word controversy because I guess I don't know. I'm really torn on this. Monday show had a contestant named Shauna High won her game. That's fine. All fine and good. During the spinning of the wheel, when the contestants always do their shout outs. In the midst of her excitement, she made a shout-out to all her friends in Canada, but she said Canadia. Now, I know people that say Canadia in jest instead of Canada. I've said Canadia before in jest because Canadia, Canadian, you've heard it before. But apparently some people on social networks tumblr and twitter in particular were like this lady must be really stupid because she doesn't even know how to pronounce canada but you have to keep in mind that people online complain about everything every little detail of every little aspect of life so she went on the news and complained that she was the rec- um, receiving cyber harassment was being bullied online because of her saying Canadia. Do you think that this is accurate, that she is being the target of cyber bullying? Or do you think that she is trying to stretch her 15 minutes of fame a little bit further than the show originally allowed? I don't know if I have a clear answer for this because I'm not exactly sure, like, what's being said besides the stuff that's going on on Twitter or whatnot, which you see every so often with like a well-known game show contestant that can get under people's skin, i.e. Arthur Chu, Matt Jackson, someone on wheel of fortune. But I don't know what this lady has received on other forms of communication, other social media, private communication. If that were true, then I think I'd be able to make a more fair assessment because I imagine unless she specifically said it was in the Twitter sphere of things, I I imagine we don't have the full scope of what might or might not have been said. The primary article linked the tweets in particular. There were three or four of them. And the fact that there was only three or four alone. I mean, there weren't like hundreds upon thousands of social media insults to this lady. She wasn't receiving death threats. She said Canadia and some people didn't realize that it was a joke. And if it was just and but then she didn't even try to defend it as like a joke. She was like, I was so caught up in the moment. I just said Canadia. She was trying to make it sound like that under the lights and everything. She forgot how to pronounce the word Canada. And that there was the red flag to me that maybe this is just her trying to milk this non story for all that it's worth. I mean, I feel that, you know, cyberbullying can be a real thing, can be a real problem. But just with her, I just don't know. I, I We've seen people who've received far more scorn on uh, Twitter, on game shows. Uh, you know, Jordan brought up Arthur Chu. Uh, I bring up Laura Ashby, uh, who was the contestant 
from uh, about a month or so ago who whenever she would pick the values for the categories she was uh, going to pick the way she inflected her voice annoyed a lot of people she would be like this category for 1000 and everybody exploded on twitter over her voice uh, everybody exploded over her voice and she had a lot of fun with it she responded back to them she took it in stride and moved on and i feel like that's probably what could happen here and she's just not doing that right i think all the points are valid but because like i personally just don't really know the extent of the back and forth and i'm sorry too much in detail it's just more that i can't give a fair response i rewatched monday's episode and i remember that there were there's you know the contestants that you know try to like gussy themselves up to drew a little bit more than they probably should grown married women who are like grinding their butts on drew's pelvic region and stuff like that shauna did not do any of that she seemed you know relatively normal just you know shout out to her kid and everything it's hard to tell it could just be that she's really sensitive to that kind of stuff and wasn't expecting it but on the other hand it's like some people always say you have every right to be offended but that doesn't make you correct i I, kind of have to agree with you there i guess we'll move on to the next topic that we have on the docket and that is talking about who wants to be a millionaire which is still on the air if you didn't (laughs) realize that it was still on the air well that's kind of what we're talking about The show has been on the air for a very long time, 17 or 18 years. I want to say 17 years. 99 sounds about right for when it started. It's gone through so many different hosts. We're now on Chris Harrison hosting it. But Millionaire, Mm -hmm. as many game show fans can probably attest, is dying. And I wanted to have a little discussion about that as to what happened with what was once by far and away the most well-known game show in the country, because in 1999, you couldn't, everyone watched Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. It was a spectacle. It was also won a lot more frequently. And now it's just kind of, it sits in the nostalgia filters of, hey, I remember that show. And people, I feel like the majority of people don't even know that they're still making new episodes. What killed it in the first place in the primetime version was overexposure. Because ABC realized, oh, we have this cash cow. Oh, let's put it on five nights a week because everybody's watching it. And yeah, for the first little bit, you know, you look at the TV ratings and Millionaire would be like, you know, five of the top ten spots. But then everybody's like, oh, man, you know, I just watched it like, you know, would be where they were getting sick of it. So that's what killed it on the primetime show is what I personally think. And then obviously once the ratings start dipping down, then you have the celebrity versions that everybody tries to use to save the show and rarely works. That's true. But I you feel know, like I they think... did something similar with Deal or No Deal seven or eight years it, ago. So I, I remember I... Deal or No Deal was on for quite a while, but that eventually died off. Millionaire perseveres for some reason. Well, I Deal mean... or No Deal also had a syndicated show, the syndicated version in the last two seasons. But I agree, Deal or No Deal wasn't quite to the extent of Five Nights, like who wants to be a millionaire was, but I do remember that it was like at least two or three nights a week that Deal or No Deal was on because they tried the same thing and it again it worked for a little bit, but then kind of slowly died off. Now this has been going on pretty slowly for a while. Like there there was mass speculation that the Cedric the Entertainer season would be the last season. The Terry Cruz season would be the last season because the rains are still going down and yet it keeps going. Is it that cheap to produce that that they still want to keep it? <laughs> I think it is that cheap because when was the last time someone legitimately won a million dollars on the show? <laughs> <laughs> they never give it away, so it's it's cheap enough to keep making. Um, I think I think they've tried to actually give it away because I remember Cedric's like first a little bit. They had like super easy questions, like up into like the million dollar question, like, you know, was I mean, obviously the question's easy if you know, it, but I'm, you know, everybody kind of watching it, yeah. you, you know, you get the Twitter was like, oh, my gosh, I knew that. Like, you know, it's I think the million dollar one was kind of tricky, but one that, you know, maybe if they'd had somebody with that knowledge, they would have won it. I mean, the show it's, is called Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, not Instant Millionaire. That is true. true. I, I feel like what made the 
syndicated version, Persevere, was it wasn't an overload of Millionaire. You didn't have to watch it, but if you watched it one day out of the week, that was probably good enough for the ratings. And Meredith Vieira was a really great host. And then, I guess for some reason, they felt the need to change formats, to try something different. And I think what really kept it on the air then was Meredith Vieira. I don't know what really kept it on the air after Cedric and Terry hosted. I, again, I guess it was the cheap to produce. I feel like this season's kind of better. Chris Harrison's not a terrible host, and they went back to the more classic format of Millionaire. But a big winner would probably be really helpful for them. You'd think that the host would be a big deal, but I feel like the decline has been going on because if you look at Terry Crews last season, he generally was pretty well received as a host, and I personally thought he's probably been the best host since Meredith, and yet he was not able to bring much to the, to the table, despite him and Cedric, I would say not being household names, but recognizable. If Terry's not household, he certainly is recognizable. Uh, not only is he, you know, starring in, you know, a sitcom on Fox currently but you know he's the old he's the second old spice guy so everybody probably recognizes terry Cruz. Not everybody, but good I, old spice guy. From, I know him from huh? uh, everybody hates chris that's the only reason i'd known him but at the same time was meredith that recognizable when she first started the syndicated version because later on you know she got the job of the today show and whatnot i would say yes but well, maybe not. Yes, I don't think she was the recognizable, but I think it helped that she was on the View at the same time. I mean, they had Meredith as a celebrity contestant during the Regis days, and they usually got pretty well known contestants for Regis Celebrity Weeks. Unlike now, where you have, with all due respect, Chip Eston, who I love from Who's Line, but he's on Nashville. That's something, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, I do agree, because they'll have their, like, special weeks and whatnot, and they're like, and on Friday, join us for a very special guest, and I'm like, probably nobody I've heard of, and I'll watch Friday, and it's, you know, somebody that I n never heard of, or just somebody, like, you know, more of a B-list, or, or something like, like that, that's you know, like... It's the like they have a parole officer and they have to fulfill community service that week. You know, that guy that's the supporting actor on that one show that only draws about three million viewers a week. <laughs> You it's only somebody that you know, but it's like not like a huge like, oh, it's Brad Pitt or something like that. Now, and, and the funny thing is, is that with some of the syndication, I've heard that be, that for whatever reason, they've moved Millionaire in some spots to like one in the morning. In that That's spots. what it's at in my uh, time zone. It's at 12.08. <laughs> yeah, I'm up to watch it at midnight. Like it works great for me versus, you know, because I have a different you know, work schedule or whatnot. But, you know, I feel like their audience is more like the daytime. Like this is the first season. Last season was on at 11 a.m. So, you know, I'd watch it right after Price is Right or whatnot. But also for the listeners, I am in the central time zone. That's why 11 a.m. is after Price is Right. Before you're like, isn't Price is Right on at 11 a.m.? <laughs> I no, must mention I think... here it's on at 8 a.m. So that's probably even worse. I believe here now, it's I on at 5.30 like, at night. Now, what was the decision factor, I wonder, in such scattered syndication? Because obviously with syndication, it's going to be different depending on your market. But there's usually, I find, a pretty basic similarity in, in the general time frame. It'll either be afternoon, evening. But why well, now is Millionaire being so scattered? I'm not an expert in syndication. I mean, I it's not a... It's not pulling in the ratings, and so some stations won't deem it worthy of that slot. And some stations are like, oh, we have nothing else to put here. Let's put Millionaire in, in a prime afternoon slot. And some stations are like, no, we've got Dr. Phil and the doctors. We don't need Millionaire here. So Because it was on our local NBC affiliate, but it actually moved stations. So now it's on, at, I think, ABC, so whatever's after that. So obviously NBC our local affiliate probably just didn't want it because it wasn't bringing in the ratings. And what they replaced it with is the, is like some John Tesh intelligence for your life that used to be on at three in the morning on our thing. And now it's on where millionaire used to be. 
So I'm assuming that it's just like it was going to cost them too much money to keep it on there for what the ratings were bringing in. Well, it's like whenever you watch Saturday Night Live also, which has been on at 1130 for a very long time. And then it's always fun to see what comes on after Saturday Night Live. At one in the morning, here at least, it's Audrina Patrick's cooking show, which she goes around what? to various <laughs> restaurants and late night fun spots. I think it's called, and. Uh... First something I forgot. Yeah, it's 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 a terrible show. Like that. But you know, like the way it's produced, you can tell that they're definitely trying for like a mid afternoon, early evening kind of time slot. Obviously, they didn't get that. But <laughs> that's because I feel like I said, there's too many shows, and I feel like affiliates have to piece together some sort of universal schedule. Because it's not like it used to be. I mean, cable channels do that. Like Nickelodeon, I'm pretty sure, has a set schedule no matter where you are. But the network affiliates can change it up. And I feel like a lot of that Mm -hmm. has to do with the news and how often your news station broadcasts. Because what's the usual news? Noon, 6 p.m., 11 p.m., and also the morning one. What time is morning news? Like 5, something like that? I know. I know some of the news you stations be... here have a 6 p.m., but they also have a 5 p.m. right before that. And then they have just like a you random see... show at 5.30. Yeah, see, you're lucky in that aspect. We have a 4 o'clock, a 5 o'clock, a 6 o'clock, a 10 o'clock, an 11.30, and then whatever's on in the morning before I wake up. So probably like a 5 or 6 or something. So we have a lot of news. So this is the station that got rid of Millionaire. They don't have any room for it because they are, like you're saying, putting on news all the time because that's probably what's bringing in the ratings. True. Do you think there's a universal chopping block where it's like there is a show that's lowest on the totem pole. If you have more than X amount of hours of news, don't air this program. If you have more than this, don't air this program. Or do you think it's entirely up to the discretion of each affiliate? I, guess I think what it's I'm discretion-based. Sure. I guess what I still wonder for Millionaire is like, why now? Why this season? Not during the Cedric season, not during the Terry, the Terry Crews because season. I, because I, because I feel like I the think... ratings, have the ratings been much worse this season? Because I feel like. Yes, the, the I ratings mean, like, are terrible. I, I, I honestly see no way that Millionaire makes it past this season. I really don't. I mean, the, I mean, I guess the numbers offhand, do you know those? It was definitely under one. And just for comparison, Jeopardy, Wheel, uh, and uh, and uh, Family Feud, they're the top three most watched. They're usually in the high six, seven area. Millionaire is under one. And I think what probably helped it in the Cedric season, at least, was I'm sure they had a few Meredith fumes running off of it. Meredith is a very lovable person. I'm sure some people tuned in to see how the show would be without her. And uh, unfortunately, they didn't stick around, it looks like. It just seems slightly weird to me that it's this season. That there's something well, I mean, about this. Maybe that... it has to do with ABC and Disney acquiring as many brands as they have recently. What they, they just picked up Star Wars not that long ago, the whole Lucasfilms thing. And that, I want to say that was a little over a year ago. So now maybe they're just kind of like, well, we can. We're, this is guaranteed money that we're sitting on over here. So we don't need to really worry about this so much. We'll just kind of, you know, let that let that die. It's slow death where nobody can. See. I mean, well, well first off, uh, I just I was talking to my brother about this. Something. I don't think ABC, I mean, or, uh, Disney. I'm like, how much more money could you need? You were already a hugely successful uh, film company. And in the 90s, you exploded. That wasn't enough money for you, so you bought a television network. In the 2000s, you were doing fine, but that wasn't enough. And Pixar exploded for you. That wasn't enough. So you bought Marvel. Marvel exploded. You're doing even better, but that wasn't enough for you. So you bought Star Wars. I have to wonder... What's next? Oh, and I forgot, between the time they were the successful film company and they bought ABC, they bought the Muppets. Like, how much but more money could you make? Is there anything wrong with that, though? I mean, Oh, no, let's... no, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm just yeah. saying, it's crazy. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm just, yeah, that's I just crazy to me. That's great that, the you know, if a company's buying all this, make money, it's make all you them, can. That's the point. I mean, some people get upset at like apple or whatnot because they're like well they're making too much money and it's like but isn't that the point of a company 
there's really no such thing. And I'm like, and I'm I feel okay like with some of those brands, a lot of it might be just easier ways for those brands to distribute themselves. Like if you watch that new Muppet show, it's a little bit different, but the heart of what makes the Muppets brand work is very much still there because it's a lot of the same people still working for it. So I don't think it's all bad. I mean, I don't think people are really complaining about Marvel owning Di- uh, Disney owning Marvel. People seem to be watching those movies just fine. Yeah, I was going to say, people were complaining about Disney getting Marvel, and I feel like the Marvel cinem- cinema franchise hasn't been much different in terms of quality. And I know people quality complain about that- Disney picking up Star Wars, but Star War- the new Star Wars movie comes out this week. And people are in a frenzy about it. They love it. No, I haven't seen anybody complain about like, oh, well, here comes Disney with another product down the pike. Well, see, that's the thing. It's like, really, you're going to complain about Disney getting Star Wars after the first after the prequel movies? I don't think there's much to complain about. They might actually make it better. We are answer... talking about millionaire folks. I know. To answer Jordan's question, why now? Well, perhaps because now they're on their third host, and maybe people are now tired of waiting to see what clicks. And then on top of that, I guarantee you that some stations changed uh, time slots in between seasons. So you've got a different host for the third straight year plus a change in time slots. That's a recipe for terrible ratings. That's true. Do you think that the Meredith era had a slow decline or was it more stagnant? I think it was stagnant and had a slow decline at the same time. It's just no legitimate winner. They had to make up a tournament to make a winner. And then after that, Again, they changed the format twice, I think. Kitchen sink time for them at that point. Throw it all in and see what happens. But speaking of hosts and changing hosts, we have a little news about the opposite happening with Family Feud. Steve Harvey just had a contract re-upping, and he will now be the host of Family Feud until at least the year 2021. Six years from now, he will still be hosting Family Feud. Did A, did we think Harvey would last this long? And B, will Feud last six more years? Uh, did, did I think he'd last this long? I mean, Harvey's first season and the way they were marketing themselves with like the certain clips, you could tell something was in the air with this version as opposed to John O'Hurley and Richard Kahn. So I could get that vibe that he would last this long. And as for six years, I guess it depends on how long people want to see this same sort of shtick we've talked about before. And again, I just wonder how long the same old, same old will keep viewers going going well i'll counter with this harvey's been host for six years already would you say that feud in 2015 has the same popularity as it did in 2010 and 11 when harvey first took over i kind of want to say it doesn't no well no wait i think feud has more popularity now than it did in 2010 if that's what you're saying uh because i mean at the 2010 was Harvey Feud got the hosting job at just the right time because Feud had finally figured out how to do the whole social media thing right when Harvey first took over. That's when Feud started posting the clips themselves of stuff that yes. happened on the show, the behind-the-scenes footage, the particularly racy answers. So for Harvey joining and him, I think it's him being a good host, but I also think a lot of it was right place, right time. Yes, that I do agree with that. I didn't think he would make it this long. I mean, this was the current feud we're talking about. And who was the longest host? Anderson was it four. Karn was four. Hurley was four, I think. So it was like, it wasn't like a long running gig. No one expected Steve Harvey to last this long. I mean, think about this. I think next year or the year after that, I think it's next year though, he'll have surpassed uh, Ray Combs as the second longest running feud host. And by the time this contract is up, he will be the longest running feud host of any version of feud. And I don't think anybody expected that. I don't know if it'll last the six years. I feel like it's not like millionaire and deal or no deal in that it's not gimmicky 
enough for me. Like it's overexposed, but unlike Deal or No Deal, it's it doesn't annoy me, annoy me the way Deal or No Deal did. And Millionaire, I, I suppose since it's not all in one place, it's syndicated. It is overexposed, but at the same time, it's not because it might air at different times in different places all around the country. I think with Feud as well, you have to keep in mind that I feel like the typical Feud audience is looking more so for entertainment and laughs as opposed to a game show. Not everybody. The six-year question depends on how long will people still be entertained by this direction of Family Feud. It's the question of is the focus of does Family Feud feel the focus of its show is the contestants or does it feel like people are tuning in to see what kind of crazy question are they going to ask next and how is Steve going to react to it? It's so hard. I feel like it's more the latter, but I think hopefully the show realizes that the former also works too because sometimes, you know, crazy answers don't have to be, you know, the sexual type of answers. Sometimes they don't have you to get force them. Yeah, sometimes you'll get just plain old stupid answers. We've talked about this in the past where it's just answers that are so stupid, they just, they'll make their own moment. So hopefully the show realizes that. Uh, I feel like they, you know, did try to force it. I feel like they've pulled back some, but not as much. Just as a side note, uh, the Chase USA aired its season finale this past Friday and Mark LeBette the Beast tweeted out that it was possibly the last episode of the series ever in the United States here, at least. Uh, so if that's the case, oh, well, I enjoyed it. I was happy to get a, a not, you know, a pretty well done translation of a British show over here. And uh, I hope that it's not the end. And I also hope that perhaps we get other British game shows. here. You in want your States. pointless. Yes, I, I really want Pointless, so I'm hoping for the best. But I, I wish everybody that worked on the Chase here to say, well, I, you know, it's never easy when your show might be over for good. Well, the rate we're going, I mean, how many shows have we gotten that were UK imports? Deal or No Deal? Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? The Weakest Link? There have been so mm-hmm. many. Yes. So maybe you'll get your wish and you'll get your Pointless. 4,000 heartbeats and the crazy answers that that provides. Uh, just on a side note, Deal or No Deal, I was just checking this. Deal or No Deal was actually Dutch first, but... Ah, that's true. Yeah. I just want to give a uh, quick happy birthday to Mr. Bob Barker. JJ already gave him a happy birthday. Well, he Mine gave wasn't him so, some Mine sort wasn't of so a happy birthday. I wanted to be officially professional, like we all are. <laughs> we don't get paid for this, last I checked. I do. <laughs> hey, you'll get paid once people start clicking those ads a little bit more. I'm about to say we're going to split that four cents ad revenue. <laughs> hey, we're up to like 83 cents now. <laughs> and that's going to wrap it up for this episode of Test is Not Appearing on Stage. <laughs> on behalf of these cohorts, I am Randy, the true host of the show, and we'll see you next time. <laughs> You're fired. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to Contestants Not Appearing on Stage, part of the Torgo Entertainment Network. For more episodes of Contestants Not Appearing on Stage, check us out on YouTube or online at cnaoscast.net.